And we begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And g'day. So good to see you. As today, we look at how God gave the prophet Jeremiah an interesting visual and verbal message. For not just Zedekiah, the king of Judah and his people, but for the other nation's kings too. Now, before we start, a quick history lesson for those who haven't read through 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles to know that there were heaps more kings after Saul, David and Solomon before this virtually unheard of King Zedekiah. And while we modern Christians may know something about this time period, we often don't take the time to stop and think about what it was really like for the people going about their daily lives while Jeremiah or any of the other prophets were given the role of God's ambassador to pass on his messages to his people. And this was one of those times in history that being alive wasn't that crash hot. Wars, death and disaster had been a part of their life for as long as anyone could remember. And then just four years ago, the most unbelievably worst thing that they could ever imagine to happen did. The shock and grief was still huge and they were still struggling to believe that God could allow such a thing to happen as letting the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar capture Jerusalem. That wasn't supposed to happen to God's people. And Nebuchadnezzar had deposed the rightful king, young Jehoiakim, and taken him, along with most of the royal family and important court officials, as captives to Babylon, setting up his relative Mataniah as puppet king. And interestingly, Nebuchadnezzar changed his name to Zedekiah, which means God is my righteousness. Perhaps Nebuchadnezzar expected Zedekiah to be loyal and faithful to his God. And so Zedekiah would keep his oath to obey him. And as we will learn over the next few sermons, the spoiler alert in 2 Chronicles chapter 36 verses 12 to 13 describing Zedekiah, Zedekiah's character is spot on as it says, He did evil in the eyes of the Lord his God and did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet who spoke the word of the Lord. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar who had made him take an oath in God's name. And this little snippet of information had let the readers know that Zedekiah had broken the third commandment. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. For while we think the command is about using God's name as a swear word, and yes, that is not a good thing to do, the command is actually about not using God's name to make an oath or a promise, unless you will. No ifs, buts or maybes. Do what you have promised to do. But four years down the track, and things are not looking good on the home front, and so in Jeremiah chapter 27, verses 1 to 2, we hear this message came to Jeremiah from the Lord early in the reign of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah. The Lord said to me, make a yoke and fasten it on your neck with leather straps. Now, just in case you don't know, this is a big, thick wooden yoke placed across the backs of oxen with leather straps, reins, to help steer them. Look up some pictures later and I think you will agree with me that is one bizarre uncomfortable request from God right there. And please keep in mind that during this chapter Jeremiah is wearing the yoke and it appears that it wasn't just the time we take to read what God had told him to say. It looks like the yoke was worn day in day out as both a symbolic action and a visible reminder for the people of God's warning messages. And the Israelite audience would have been more than happy to hear God say in his first message, then send messages to the kings of Edom, Moab, Ammon, 
Tyre and Sidon through their ambassadors who have come to see King Zedekiah in Jerusalem give them this message for their masters. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel says, with my great strength and powerful arm, I made the earth and all its people and every animal. I can give these things of mine to anyone I choose. Now I will give your countries to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, who is my servant. I have put everything, even the wild animals, under his control. Finally, some good news. Their arch enemies, whose ambassadors were here trying to wheedle King Zedekiah into some nefarious plot to overthrow the Babylonian king, were going to get their comeuppance and become part of the Babylonian kingdom. But after the last couple of sermons, discovering how we are all to be God's ambassadors, I found it fascinating seeing how God, the King of Kings and Lord of Heaven's armies, is using the world system of communicating to other leading powers through their ambassadors. Jeremiah, as God's prophet, was God's official ambassador, giving God's message to all the important official looking ambassadors to carry home to their kings. And I wonder how they felt on the journey home about having to give their kings this unpalatable message from the God of Israel. Because even if they believed it was a load of bunkum, as their king's ambassador, they were required to deliver any message from another king or his God. And while they had been trying to figure out ways to solve the threat and overthrow Nebuchadnezzar, at the same time, this prophecy couldn't be taken lightly. For Nebuchadnezzar's army had proven it was strong and powerful by capturing Jerusalem, which they had been trying to do for years. But what we often miss as we quickly skim over to get to the stern warning command from God is how this prophecy to the other nations is showing everyone, not just God's people, that God is in control of what is happening. For there is no way anyone could assert as positively as Jeremiah did as he continued with. All the nations will serve him, his son and his grandson, up until his time is up. Then many nations and great kings will conquer and rule over Babylon. All the other ambassadors must have thought Jeremiah had rocks in his head to be putting a time frame on the end of Babylon's power. They would be going, oh yeah, right, pull the other leg, saying that in only three generations, the Babylonian superpower would be defeated. That's not likely. Now remember, they didn't have the benefit of looking back over thousands of years of history to see how super powerful nations rise up and fall again within only a few generations. Mind you, knowing that doesn't make it any easier as you watch leaders trying to grab more power by gaining control over other nations. And so they would have been fearful about their king's response to Israel's God's disturbing message that their plans were going to fail and they would be under Nebuchadnezzar's control. But they couldn't, by any stretch of the imagination, see their king taking kindly to Jeremiah's next pointed statement. You must submit to Babylon's king and serve him. Put your neck under Babylon's yoke. Now the ambassadors and anyone else listening, while they were looking at Jeremiah wearing an oxen yoke, struggling under the weight, trying when his movements shifted the weight unevenly across his back to get the yoke back evenly spaced across the shoulders, giving them a vivid picture of the harshness of being under a yoke. They didn't make the mistake of thinking of a literal oxen yoke. They immediately knew this was a typical metaphor for servitude. And here it was clearly political servitude to another nation, Babylon, the last nation you would want to be serving under. And as if that wasn't bad enough to tell their kings, it gets worse. 
as they hear Jeremiah loudly proclaim, I will punish any nation that refuses to be his slave, says the Lord. I will send war, famine and disease upon that nation until Babylon has conquered it. The ambassadors looked at each other as collectively th they thought, really, the nerve of Israel's God to say that he will punish anyone who refuses to bow under Babylon's yoke. Our gods are just as good, if not better, and so they will be able to protect us, won't they? Yep, Israel's God has been weakened when the Babylonian army captured Jerusalem. No need to worry. Mm, but then again, didn't Israel's God keep telling the Israelites that that is what will happen if they don't stop worshipping other gods like theirs and turn back to worshipping only him? And some remembered their great-grandfathers mocking Israel's God for how way back there was this prophet Isaiah who had proclaimed that their God will, which we find in Isaiah chapter 5 verse 26. Send a signal to a distant nation. He whistles for it to come from the far regions of the earth. And now how nothing had happened, making them think Israel's God was just a big windbag bragging about what he would do, but he doesn't have the power to do it. But then, four years ago, the Babylonian army came from far, far away and captured Israel as their God had said. Doubts were beginning to assail them. But their confidence returned as they remembered that their God's prophets and the prophets around King Zedekiah were all saying, don't panic, God's got this. He will send the army away like he did for King Jehoshaphat. Read about it later in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 1 to 30. And then Jeremiah's voice intruded upon their thoughts as he pointed the finger at them and firmly declared, Do not listen to your false prophets, fortune tellers, interpreters of dreams, mediums and sorcerers who say the king of Babylon will not conquer you. They are all liars and their lies will lead to your being driven out of your land. I will drive you out and send you far away to die. But the people of any nation that submits to the king of Babylon will be allowed to stay in their own country, to farm the land as usual. I, the Lord, have spoken. You can almost see them rolling their eyes at this. And they probably said, look, Jeremiah, I'm sure you mean well, but as they wave their arms towards the king Zedekiah's prophets, all those prophets are speaking in your God's name, saying he says it won't happen. And then it's the same back home where our God's prophets are saying the king of Babylon won't conquer us. You're just one person. What do you know? How can you say you know more than all these prophets? And the ambassadors headed off home to give their kings the ridiculous message from Israel's God. And while Jeremiah would have been dismayed that they hadn't taken God's word seriously, that was now between them and his God when what he had said came true. But God knew this message was important. And while King Zedekiah had heard Jeremiah give the ambassadors God's message for their nations to submit to Babylon's yoke, clearly he didn't think it was meant for him, for they were already living under Babylon's yoke. And so God had Jeremiah repeat this same message to King Zedekiah of Judah. It is frustrating not knowing whether this message was given straight after the ambassadors left or whether Jeremiah had given King Zedekiah time to change his attitude towards Babylon and truly submit to the political yoke that had been placed upon him. And God, knowing he hadn't changed, then added more to the message as Jeremiah proclaimed to King Zedekiah, if you want to live, submit to the yoke of the king of Babylon and his people. Why do you insist on dying, you and your people? Why should you choose war, famine and disease, which the Lord will bring against every nation that refuses to submit to Babylon's king? Can't you hear God's frustration at how, yet again, 
his king is refusing to obey him and insisting on doing what he thinks is best for the nation. And God knows that the biggest reason for his continued disobedience is how he has been sucked in by the lies told using his God's name in vain. And so God has Jeremiah repeat his stern warning to King Zedekiah. Do not listen to the false prophets who keep telling you the king of Babylon will not conquer you. They are liars. This is what the Lord says. I have not sent these prophets. They are telling you lies in my name. So I will drive you from this land. You will all die. You and all these prophets too. Part of me feels for King Zedekiah. It's easy to sit in judgment knowing what does happen in the future. But we also need to take into account that Zedekiah hadn't expected to become king. After all, he was the third son of King Josiah. Two older brothers to have sons meant he didn't have to worry about learning about what responsibilities are required of a king. And then he was only 21 when Nebuchadnezzar made him king. And then to make it even harder, Nebuchadnezzar had carted all the court officials and leading men, along with King Jehokan, off to Babylon. So there was no experienced court officials to give him sound, wise advice. And if you've got a whole bunch of people in one corner claiming they are speaking from God, giving you good news, and in the other corner you have one man also claiming to God spoke to him, giving you tough, hard-to-swallow advice, who will you believe? And before you say Jeremiah, think about how many Christians are loudly proclaiming certain behaviours as acceptable are out there in our modern world and other Christians push back to find themselves sheltered down and having to back down and stay quiet about something they know God doesn't approve of. This is what King Zedekiah was facing. If he chose to believe Jeremiah, he would have all those of prophets who had the ear of his officials saying to him, How dare you not believe us? How dare you believe Jeremiah is telling the truth when he is saying God isn't going to help us? We need to submit to Babylon's yoke. And as king under God, Zedekiah was meant to proclaim God's truth to his people. But he couldn't decide what is the truth and so went with appeasing the larger crowd. And with Zedekiah failing his God-ordained responsibilities as king, God then had Jeremiah speak to the priests and the people, telling them, this is what the Lord says, do not listen to your prophets who claim that soon the gold articles taken from my temple will be returned from Babylon. It is all a lie. Do not listen to them. Surrender to the king of Babylon and you will live. Why should this whole city be destroyed? If they really are prophets and speak the Lord's messages, let them pray to the Lord of heaven's armies. Let them pray that the articles remaining in the Lord's temple and in the king's palace and in the palaces of Jerusalem will not be carried away to Babylon. Now, if you have read the 2 Kings chapter 24, verse 13 account of when Nebuchadnezzar captured Jerusalem, we know that not only did he cut off the royal family and nobles and officials, he also stripped the temple of its valuable gold items, removing all the riches in the treasuries of the Lord's temple and of the royal palace. The bronze articles and some of the heavier items were left behind. And so to the priests, these original items left from Solomon's temple were prized and revered. And here is Jeremiah on behalf of God telling the priests those false prophets had better start praying for them to remain because God has said they are all going to go to Babylon very soon. And by association, the priests had better start praying as well. But Jeremiah leaves them 
with the concerning thought that time will tell who is the true prophet. But the priests too couldn't believe that God would allow that to happen to them and the temple. After all, God had told the Israelites in the desert, which we find in Leviticus chapter 26, verses 11 to 13, I am the Lord your God, and you will be my people. I will dwell and walk among you. I broke the bars of your yoke, bringing you out of slavery in Egypt, so you can walk with heads held high. Jeremiah had to be mistaken. God had promised they could now walk proud, for their God was living and walking among them. Sure, there had been times when they had been under the yoke of the surrounding nation, but that was nothing compared to now being under the Babylonian yoke. The prophets had to be right that the treasures that had already been taken away would return shortly. Yes, Jeremiah was wrong. And Jeremiah's next words would have certainly shaken them to the core as he continues with, For the Lord of heaven's armies has spoken about the pillars in front of the temple, the great bronze basin called the sea, the water carts, and all the other ceremonial articles King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon left here when he exiled Joachim, king of Judah, to Babylon, along with all the other nobles of Judah and Jerusalem. Yes, this is what the Lord of heaven armies, the God of Israel, says about the precious things still in the temple, in the palace of Judah's king and in Jerusalem. They will all be carried away to Babylon. Now, I don't think all these messages happened in one day. There is this feeling that Jeremiah delivered God's unpalatable message over a period of time. And during the whole time, he was still burdened with the oxen yoked across his shoulders, adding a compelling visual to his words. They couldn't ignore God's message, delivered as it was visually and verbally. And yet they all, to a man, chose to believe the well-dressed prophets, giving them the good news that life would be great in a couple of years and the treasures would be restored to them. This must have been tough for Jeremiah to have to pretend he didn't care that they didn't believe him and were choosing to believe the large vocal crowd of prophets. I wonder whether there were times when he even questioned himself about whether he had really heard God tell him to give this counterintuitive message of submitting to an enemy's yoke. Did he question perhaps whether the other prophets were right? Was God giving mixed messages? But clearly, even if these doubts arose in his mind, he was able to counter to them going, no, God spoke to me and his message hasn't changed since he gave the consequences of disobeying him to Moses to pass on to the Israelites. For while, as the priest said, God had promised they could walk tall because God was with them, but they were ignoring the many warnings God had given his people about what would happen if they chose to disobey God and follow their own desires. For straight after the beautiful, beautiful promise, God starts giving the, if you will not listen to God's consequences, which increased in intensity until in Leviticus, Chapter 26, verse 37, God had declared, You will not be able to stand before your enemies. You will perish. Your enemies will devour you. You who are left will waste because of their sins and their father's sins. And then, just in case they had forgotten the warning, God, as they were about to enter the promised land, reiterates the warning in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 48 which helped Jeremiah know he was right, for God had unequivocally stated that you will serve the enemies the Lord sends against you. He will put an iron yoke on your neck until he has destroyed you. The Lord will bring a nation against you from far away, from the ends of the earth. And constantly, God had also given them hope with the warnings, like when the prophet Isaiah proclaimed, 
for God in chapter 58, verses 9 to 10. Then you will call and cry for help, and the Lord will answer, saying, Here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, instead helping the hungry and oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. And so Jeremiah knew that God's final message would be one of hope and he wasn't disappointed, for it was. Although perhaps not the hope the people were looking for, as he tells them, the treasures will stay there until I send for them. Then I will bring them back to Jerusalem again. No clear time frame here. They just have to hope and trust in God's word. That must have been hard. For as we modern Christians know, it was 70 years later before the Israelites and the treasures were able to return home to the temple. Now you may think, ah, oh, that's a nice history lesson, but what's it got to do with me, a modern Christian living today? Good question. Now, as we have learned over the last few sermons, all of us modern Christians are also God's ambassadors. And I reckon we would all agree it is nice to think that we will not be asked to, like Jeremiah was, go around wearing a real yoke. But what we do need to do is listen out, to hear God, to find out who he will send us to, to give them God's message of salvation with its counter choice of death, if you choose to ignore the truth. Now, some of us will be asked by God to go to the king, prime minister or leaders to try and get them to see that making decisions not in keeping with God's word will, at some point, impact badly upon the welfare and well-being of the nation. And you could go, well, why should we bother? The king and leaders didn't listen to Jeremiah. Well, you see, that doesn't quite work as an excuse in God's eyes. For back in Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 27, God had told Jeremiah, you shall say all these things to them, but they will not listen to you. You shall call to them, but they will not respond to you. Some of us may be called to go to our pastors or ministers and give them God's message to not cave into the loud voices that are proclaiming a message that while it sounds good, is not from God. It is contrary to God's plans. Again, whether they listen or not, the important thing is that they have been told. Their response is up to them. But the one thing I can positively and definitely say is that all of us will be given the chance to give someone in our corner of the world God's message of salvation with its counter choice of death if they choose to ignore the truth. And I believe that while we didn't hear it in today's reading, there were some people who did respond to Jeremiah's message. Sadly, not enough to make a difference to the outcome for the nation. But it made a difference to those people and gave them a hope and a new life with God. But we not only need to give people the message of good news, we should also do what Jeremiah told the prophets to do. Pray for all Christians to be like Jeremiah and give God's message to the people he sends them to. Even though you know that the chances are high that they won't listen. But you keep on praying that God's Spirit will help them see the message as the truth it is and receive the gift of salvation and things will happen. Amen.